Houston, Ferguson uh, this last week, went to uh, run and do a training for some uh, don't we got some university folks in the house? Any Ivy folks? Okay, there we go. Um, I was in doing some, uh, some training for university folks from around the country in, in Ferguson and also spending some time with some of our uh, young activist leaders, uh, Hands Up United. And while we were sitting at the, in the room with the folks from Hands Up United, a young man in Ferguson, Missouri was shot in the face and killed. And it, it was an interesting thing to actually go with the young leaders right when it happened. So we stopped all of our meeting, got in the cars, and ran over to the scene. And to see uh, the mother in, in pain and mourning, still sitting out there on the ground, the father in pain and mourning, and standing there and feeling that sense of helplessness and that sense of here we are here in Ferguson trying to do the work of the Lord, and yet we've got this other dynamic that's happening that's outside of our control. And so I think one of the things we want to hold together is that life is happening all around us, so I think the question is, how do I maintain the positive confession that God is giving me in my mouth and in my spirit in a world that is totally out of control? That at some point, either I am going to overcome the world or I am going to allow the world to overcome me. I like to take us to kind of the way in which we can see this in the life of Joseph. Joseph, very interesting person for all our young folks that were in the room. Joseph was only 17 years old. So he wasn't an incredibly old uh, person like Deacon McBride. Hey, man. I can just mess with him because he's my dad and I got the mic. That's all. But he, 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 was, he was this younger uh, brother who the Bible says that his father had this great love for Joseph. And so he made Joseph this coat of many colors. It was, uh, some translations will speak of it as a robe. Uh, some will speak of it as a tunic. This, it was this kind of expression that was either made up of many colors or many different parts. That was a beautiful, exquisite uh, coat that Joseph was given. And, and when Joseph was given this coat, this coat spoke to Joseph of the favor of God upon his life. This coat spoke of the affirmation of God from his father that you are someone important and someone of great gifting by this coat that you have received. And as Joseph received that coat, while it created this very wonderful experience for him, it created a very challenging experience for his brothers. Go on to this next point where it says coats. We're going to talk about the coat for a few minutes. While Joseph experienced this coat, and it was very powerful, the scripture says that Joseph's brothers began to become very jealous of him because of how God had gifted him and how God had affirmed him in the public space. Now, this family, you got to understand, had a lot of family drama. And we don't have a, it would take us like about two months to go through the series of their family drama. I'm just going to give y'all, can I give two minutes of the family drama? So Jacob, Joseph's father, was a hustler, right? He was, right? And, and Jacob's, Jacob was the kind of person that he was in love with Rachel. Now, I'm not trying to make any of our sisters mad. There's a whole different time with, with women being seen as property. We know it's not that way. Amen? All right, so y'all don't shoot me. I'm just telling the story. I ain't got no security in here, okay? So... So in any case, Jacob went to uh, uh, Rachel's father, Laban, and he said, I'm in love with Rachel and I want to marry her. And he said, OK, well, you got to work for me for seven years in order to get Rachel. So Joseph was I mean, uh, Jacob was like, man, all right, we're going to all right, I'm going to do this. So then he he works for him for seven years and then gets tricked by by his uncle, Rachel's dad. That's a whole whole nother situation. Right. But. <laughs> This is the Bible we all read. Somebody say amen, right? So, so then he gets with that he gets married to who he thinks is Rachel, but it finds out it is her sister. But he slept with her all night before he realized it was the wrong person. That's a whole nother situation, right? So then he says, No, you gave me the wrong daughter. He says, Okay, work for me another seven years, and then you'll get Rachel. So after 14 years, he ends up with Leah and Rachel, but he doesn't love Leah. He only loves Rachel, but he keeps getting Leah pregnant. So there's this whole set of sons from Leah who Jacob really doesn't like her, who she keeps having children, naming them these names, trying to get Jacob's affirmation. 
These kids grow up in this identity of who they are, which is not the identity of God in their life. So when they all get older, they're dealing with this whole kind of little kind of step drama that's really toxic in this family. Then when he has his first son, Joseph, by Rachel, the woman he really loved, he treats him with all this great respect. That's a story, ain't it? I feel like real housewives of Hebrew Bible or something, right, guys? <laughs> Woo. The Bible would be a reality show like you have never seen before, right? So out of this, we have Jacob now. And this is a whole nother message, right? There's a lot going on there. But we have Jacob now who has his son Joseph, and I want us to appreciate the tension in the relationship between Joseph and his brothers. That Joseph has nothing to do with the challenge that's happened with his brothers, but now the calling of his own life is also in tension with the history of all of this reality. He receives the coat and his brothers hate him and are jealous of him of it. Then Joseph also, because of his gifting, Joseph is a dreamer who has dreams and has the ability to interpret these dreams. And as Joseph begins to tell his dreams and begin to unpack God's destiny on him and how that is going to relate to the rest of their family, I invite you when you get time, read from Genesis 37 all the way through Genesis 50, 51. You'll, you'll get a chance to get this whole story. But, but as Joseph uh, begins to tell that, his brothers hated him even the more to the point that they said, let's kill that dude. We're tired of hearing about him. We're tired of seeing the whole situation. We're tired of seeing the pain that our mother is going through with respect to Jacob. None of this is in the Bible. It's just my little sidebar commentary. Hey, man, you, you read it for yourself, right? But I kind of see it through those eyes. So Joseph is having all this kind of tension with his brothers. But the reality is the tension and the challenge of his family dynamic still didn't have anything to do with the fact that God favored him and God gifted him to do something very important in the world. One of the reasons I'm holding that up is I think it's important for us to recognize that when God has given you this coat, this, this affirmation, this purpose, this call upon your life, it's not always going to be received by everybody. Right? That there's some people that are not going to value your coat, the call on your life, sometimes for justified reasons from their own trauma. But we must remember that God is never calling us to not be who we are just because who we are might be disruptive to others. And sometimes we have things in the world, and even sometimes it can come in the church, that somehow being who God has called me to be somehow has to shrink because it might be disruptive to others. But I believe sometimes when we do that, we also begin to uh, uh, make smaller uh, the call of God that is upon our life. Joseph gives his dream, and at a certain point, the brothers decide, we've heard enough of this dream. This is the scripture I gave just to kind of set the stage for us. We've heard enough of this dream. Let's kill Jacob, Joseph. And so as Joseph comes out to them one day as they're working in the field and, and doing the work uh, as they were older brothers, Jacob, uh, Joseph comes out and the brothers rise up and they grab him and they strip him of his coat. They say, we're tired of looking at you with this demonstration of who you are in your life. And they take his coat and they take Joseph and throw him into a pit where Joseph is there. And I can imagine for Joseph at that moment feeling like the coat that I have is probably the worst thing that I have because it's landed me in this pit. Have you ever had the feeling where sometimes you feel like who I am seems to be uh, a, more of a burden than a blessing? Have you ever thought about that? Like sometimes, you know, I just wish I could take this way that I am and take it off of me. Because all it seems to bring me is a lot of challenge and a whole lot of things uh, that I don't want. But because of, of how we're broken by sin as a people, we oftentimes uh, aren't able to appreciate the gifting of God in other people. But I want to say for us that God loves us and has demonstrated great love and manifestations of love upon our life. And we never have to shrink away from the reality of that coat and God's gifting in our life. That God has gifted you for very specific reasons for what you're supposed to do in helping to build this world. Now, all of us aren't gifted in the same types of ways. But how many know every gifting is equal in the eyes of God? There, there's, a, there's a lot of drama in Genesis. You really got to read Genesis. It's a good book, a lot of drama, makes it interesting, good book. Because one of the other issues that happened with Jacob, Joseph's father, of which this whole challenge came out of, was Jacob tricked his father, Isaac, 
out of the inheritance of his brother Esau by putting on the hairy, some hairy goat hair on his arm because Esau was a hairy person and his, his father Isaac was blind. So he went in and, and, and he let his father rub his arm uh, to try to be somebody else, you know, his brother, so he could steal his father's inheritance, his brother's inheritance. And there's a lie that, that's there that we can't unpack, but I just want you to get because it speaks to this conversation we're having about identity, that it is a lie that the enemy and society tries to bring us that the only way we can be accepted in the eyes of our father is to be dressed in the skins of our brother. Because God has created all of us in very special ways to do very special things, to accomplish very specific realities, to build the world that God is making. So somebody put your hand on yourself and say, I love me. That I might not be loud. I don't need to be loud. That God wants to do something out of my quiet self. That if I am loud, I don't need to be soft because God wants to do something out of my loudness. Some of us like to fight. I just got to make sure we get that fight targeted. Some of us are extremely diplomatic. Some of us want to go out on the streets and protest. Some of us want to create businesses to help support. Some of us want to do art to actually cast out some vision into the world. Some of us want to deep dive into academia so that we can develop thought about how God may make the world. Some of us just want to work at the car wash and shake hands with people when they come in during the day. Look at the person next to you and say, God loves you. So love yourself. God gives us this coat to affirm for us the presence and the call of God. But oftentimes who we are is inside the context of this larger world that we're in. And it finds us in the pit. After Joseph got uh, uh, thrown into the pit, I first talked about the coat. Now I want to talk about the challenge. Because there is a challenge associated with the coat. Joseph falls, uh, is thrown into the pit, stripped of his coat goes through this whole process where then he's sold into slavery, into Egypt, according to this story and this narrative. He's sold into Egypt where he finds himself a slave at the house of a rich person named Potiphar. That still doesn't end the story. Potiphar's wife liked Joseph. So then she tried to get it, Joseph. This don't even sound like I'm preaching the Bible, does it? This is... It sounds like some scandalous affair, right? You know, like, somebody give me the real Bible, right? And this is all in the Bible, right? <laughs> so Potiphar's wife tries to get with Joseph. Joseph, even though he's in slavery, doesn't forget that he is the one that's been given the coat. He recognizes that I still have value on my life, that I still have a calling. And even though I might be in indentured servanthood or, or indentured slavery... I still am who God has made me to be. But he's in this challenge. She tries to, in essence, um, all right. So she tries to do that. And it says that Joseph ends up pulling out and leaves the coat he had on there. Something with Joseph and these coats, right? He's only getting pulled out his coat. And then subsequently, she accuses him of trying to rape her. And then Joseph is unjustly incarcerated. Now Joseph is in prison. For years. So I, I want you to imagine, well, I'm trying to lift up this idea of challenges. Even though God has made us in certain ways of, of which God affirms and God loves, it doesn't mean that we're going to find that void of challenge. That actually, in order, I believe, for God to birth out of us how God has made us, it has to go through some challenge. You don't, you don't get pure gold without the fire. I heard somebody say years ago, I love this. He, he said, you know, everybody loves bacon and eggs. Well, not now. I mean, everybody's into gluten-free muffins and stuff like that. But that's back when we used to eat. Uh, I don't know, you know if it was regular food. I don't know, you know, everybody's a foot taller now, so who knows what we've been eating, right? But in any case, this analogy says that everybody loves bacon and eggs. And he said, but there's a difference between getting bacon and getting eggs. That in order to get eggs, the chicken just has to lay an egg. But in order to have bacon, the pig has got to die. So you have a conversation about breakfast with a pig and a chicken. Two of them going to have different kind of realities about what's going on. I'm lifting, all, uh, uh, lifting that up to say is that we all want the reward of living into the fullness of our calling. But we don't necessarily want the challenge. 
But look at the person next to you and say, you got to have the challenge. But I think one of the important things is while you're going through the challenge, how do we continue to remember who God is, how God has made us, and that God is not just the God that gives us the coat, but he's also the God who's willing to be with us through the challenge. Joseph finds himself in prison trying to help. And it's funny with Joseph's life, and these are some of the things I want to help us see today, is that when the call of God is upon your life, it doesn't matter where you are, that call is always there. Joseph had the call on his life when he was with his brothers. He had the call on him when he was with Potiphar. He had the call on him even when he was in prison. He rose to the top of all the prisoners and found himself helping and in service. It's important for us to know that God has a plan for our life. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I have for you to give you a hope and a future. That God says, I have a call upon your life to give you hope and a future. So when you're going through your challenge, you must remember that I am the God who brought you in or allowed you in. But I am also the God who will bring you out. And so we must hold on to a powerful confession, even when we're in the middle of challenge, that we recognize that God has not abandoned me. But while I am experiencing life, God is going to be faithful to bring me out. Joseph languished in prison for years, helping others who were incarcerated. And he got to this point while he was in prison where he ended up helping someone who was also in prison with him, who subsequently became the person who remembered him once he left out years later. And that became the way that Joseph got out of prison. Joseph gets out of prison and goes from the prison literally to the palace. Joseph comes out of the prison and within a couple years, is the second in charge in Egypt next to the Pharaoh. I want to talk to us about calling. Because finally, Joseph's dreams were realized. He, he had uh, this anointing put on him, this affirmation of God, this value of God with receiving this coat. He had to go through some challenge. He had to go through some valleys. He had to go through uh, some different kinds of realities. But it all led him to this place where he was able to begin to live into his calling. Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dream and is able to save Egypt and the whole region from economic disaster. I want to help us realize that the gifting that God has given you is not just to be kept inside your own little world. That the gifting that God has given you in your life is not necessarily just for you to hold and just for you to be able to make resources, but that God has also given you a gifting that will be able to build the world that God is making. That in the middle of all that, we can recognize that I've been gifted not just for myself, but I've been gifted to be a part of the world that God is making. And so it gives me the ability to go through the challenge when I recognize that God is trying to make something in me that I otherwise could not get on my own. I like to say uh, this as well, that between where God uh, has called you and in order to get to where God is taking you, you've got to deal with some hell in the hallway. How many can attest that there's some hell in the hallways? Now, how many also can contest that once God brings you through, you got a different kind of faith and a different kind of joy and a different kind of praise and a different kind of anointing? But that doesn't mean that we like the hallway. I hate when people preach, you know, I, I thank God for the hallway. I, shut the <laughs> I don't like the hallway at all. Usually the whole time I'm in the hallway, I'm, I'm telling God, man, what's wrong with you? I want out of this. I just want the blessing. I just want the anointing, but I don't want the, ha the, the hallway. But the gifting and the calling of God on our lives must take the testing so that God can give birth to the calling. Somebody say, I'm called. Look at the person next to you and say, you're called. Look at the other person on the other side and say, so don't go nowhere. We must have a positive confession. There are times in your life where you literally are going to have to prophesy to yourself. There are times when there's not going to be anybody to cheer you on. 
We all love those times where we're being affirmed, but there's a lot of times where you're going to have to dig deep inside yourself and say, I believe that God has anointed me. I believe that God has called me. I know God has a plan for my life. I know God has given me dreams. And even though I've got people that don't want to affirm it, I've been put in prison and I've been put in bondage and I'm dealing with oppression because of it. But I know who God has made me to be and I'm willing to deal with a little pain so that I can be service to God to get to some promise. Somebody say a positive confession. We've got to teach ourselves and model with one another how to put a prophetic word in our mouth. That we should walk up to one another and speak into one another's life. I'm going to speak to you in the middle of your challenge and remind you of who God is calling you to be. Somebody say calling. Joseph went through his brother's jealousy He went through all of the oppression through the challenge, and then he finds himself in the courts of the palace with Pharaoh, positioned to live out his calling. Here's one of the interesting things I find in Joseph's life. When he gets with Pharaoh in the world's system, this is before they were oppressing the Hebrews. This is actually how the Hebrews found their way into, according to the scriptures, I know we got some some, uh, historical anthropological professionals in the room. So I'm just talking from the story. Somebody say amen. I need security when I'm in here. Praise the Lord. Right? So Joseph uh, is there, and it says that he receives a new robe from the Pharaoh, a gold necklace on his neck, and chariots to go do the work that he has to do. 30 years previously, probably, Joseph has a dream that leads him to the pit. But because he could hold on to the positive confession, because he refused to give up, because he kept enduring through the pain, because he kept believing that the same God that gave him a a powerful gift, that the same God who had uh, his life affirmed by his father, he believed that that same God could bring him all the way through to the place of calling and the place of promise. Now, here's one of the interesting things in this story. You get to the end around Genesis 50. It's about 13, 14 chapters, some of those not dealing with Joseph's life. You get to the end, and Joseph's brothers, who threw him into the pit, are also now experiencing the famine that Joseph ends up giving the dream and the prophecy about. They come to Egypt seeking to get some resources of which Joseph has saved the resources in the Egyptian empire. And they find themselves in the room with Joseph, and they can't even recognize him. And Joseph sits there with the brothers who tried to end his life, the brothers who betrayed him. And at that moment, Joseph tells him, what you meant for evil, God has turned around for the good. I want to encourage some folks today that we can say, God, even though I'm going through some challenge, I thank you for my coat. I thank you for making me the way that you've made me, even though it's brought about some challenges and some frustrations. I can thank you for how you've made me, even though right now I might be in the place where I am being attacked and I'm being oppressed and I'm receiving critique. I can thank you for how you've made me because I know that how you made me is going to end up landing me in a place where I'm able to do your will, where I'm able to to give love, where I'm able to give power, where I'm able to live out the life you've called me to live. We can be thankful for our struggles, not for the struggles, but for the result we know will come through the struggles. Psalm 23 and 4 says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 1 Thessalonians 5 24 says, faithful is the one who has called you, who also will bring it to pass. I want to say for some of us today, let us get a positive confession in our mouth. Let us begin to joy in our tribulation, not for our tribulation, but joy in it, knowing that God has given us a coat, that God has affirmed our lives 
that God has affirmed the purpose in us. And while we resist a lot of things in the world, right, we resist injustice, we resist all the isms that we know are oppressive to people, we must resist that. But let us also resist the voice of the world and broader society that would tell us that we are less than what God has made us. Let us stand firmly and recognize that I might be locked up or might have been locked up, but that doesn't make me a felon. That makes me God's son that's now ready to carry a message of freedom. I might have been someone who's actually gone through the challenge and gone through the terrible oppression of being abused and assaulted as a child, but that does not make me a victim. That makes me someone who is able to have a different kind of empathy and a person that is going to be positioned to be able to minister healing to others who've been broken. God, thank you for my coat. The coat isn't the pain that happened to me. The coat is the, is the, is the, the, the blessing of God upon my life that always can redeem whatever has happened. You think about this world and recognize that God always has a way to step through the pain and step through the trouble and cause freedom to happen. Even in our world, you have black folks who were stripped away from the land of Africa. Many of them sold into slavery, some by their brothers, stolen by their oppressors. 400 years of bondage here in this country. But even in the middle of that, God finds a way to step through that pain. And I'm telling you, if God could step through the pain for Joseph, if God could step through the pain of all the stories around the world, then God could step through in your life. God could step through your struggle. God could step through your oppression. God could step through your harm. He can step through your pain. He can step through your indecision. And God will bring you out. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm coming out of this. Uh, Come on, tell somebody else, say, I'm coming out of this. I'm not going to get stuck in my pain. I'm not going to get stuck in the pit. I'm not going to get stuck in what folks did to me. But I am going to thank God for my coat. I'm going to thank God that I'm going to be who God has called me to be. I'm going to rise up from my pain. I'm going to rise up from my trouble. I'm going to rise up from what I'm dealing with so that God can bring me into calling. This is the time, brothers and sisters. For us to get a prophetic word in our mouth, we should go around and be vehicles that are speaking the word of God into one another's lives. So I encourage us as we launch off this month of the power of confession. When someone comes up and says, man, this is what's going on in my life. Let's hear that. Let's receive that. But let's speak the powerful word of God back into their life. You might be going through. And I'm going to sit here with you while you go through. But we know that our God is able to bring you through the pain, to bring you through the trouble, because the calling on your life is worth it. Lastly, what would have happened if Joseph gave up in jail? What would have happened if Joseph gave up in the pit? What would have happened If Joseph allowed the pain of his yesterday to fill his heart so much to the point that he couldn't contribute to the joys of the future, Joseph ended up forgiving his brothers, became reconciled to them, and saved their family from famine. But here's the thing I think is important. This is why the power of confession and recognizing calling is important. His brothers didn't realize that God had Joseph in their life, one reason, potentially, so that they wouldn't experience the famine. But denying the calling of Joseph's life landed them in famine. So encourage us as well. Let's both affirm the coat that is upon us, but let us also affirm the coat that is upon others. That God, listen, God might have people in your life that might feel like irritants to you. <laughs> Folks that you like, where's the pit? Where's the pit? Where's the pit? You know, <laughs> you want some Starbucks? Come on, we'll right over here on the pit. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> here I am to worship, you know. Let us ensure that we don't kick out of our lives some of the very people that God has put in our lives to give us sometimes what we don't want to hear, but need to hear. Because how many know the word of God and the story of God and the moving of the spirit of God 
does not change with respect to us, but we must change in respect to God. Let's stand on our feet.